Good morning church and welcome to our online service this morning. Whether you are old friends or new, you are so welcome. We are delighted to have you with us and we pray that God will pour out his blessing upon you. We are excited to be welcoming three new people into membership this morning, Moira, Maureen and Leona. We are so thrilled that you are joining us and we pray that God will lead and guide you into the ministry he has for you here at Breton Baptist Church. We look forward to hearing from Brian later this morning, speaking to us from John chapter 5 on unlocking spiritual doors. But don't forget our prayer, praise and prophecy meeting on Zoom this evening at 7.45pm. Details will be posted in the chat section. And can I remind you that this Tuesday is our monthly day of prayer and fasting. Do try to set aside some time during the day to pray for our church family and the way forward. This month, we will have three short half hour Zoom prayer meetings that anyone can join in with. They will be at 8 a.m., 12.30 p.m. and 8 p.m. Details including the link will be sent to you. So as we begin our service today, let us pray together. Father God, we welcome you into our homes now as we join together in the unity of the Spirit. We may not be together in the church building, but we are together as your church and nothing can separate us from being together in you. We come to worship you today, to lift up your name, the name of Jesus, the name which is above every name, the name on which we depend and in whom we trust, and we say, we love you, Jesus. We stand in awe of you, the creator of all things, the Lord who is sovereign over all. And we offer this time to you now that we might listen to what you have to say to us and that we might be blessed by your presence with us. 
Come Holy Spirit and minister to us this morning, we pray. Amen. your goodness I would be desperate without your love 
Slave to the darkness If it wasn't for the cross You have won me With your kindness Chased me down when I was lost Where would I be if it wasn't for the cross Hallelujah Thank you Jesus I was a prisoner Now I'm not Cause with your blood you Bought my freedom Hallelujah For the cross shame was met with mercy now your mercy will be my song and all the glory over the power of the cross oh hallelujah thank you Jesus I was a priest Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, cause with your blood you bought my freedom, oh hallelujah, for the cross, oh hallelujah, thank you Jesus.
As part of our service this morning, let's share our prayers of intercession. Father God, we thank you for promising to walk with us. You know us and you love us. No matter where we find ourselves, we are not out of your reach, your care and your grace. May we constantly discern your plan for our lives and how you would use us to support our brothers and sisters and to bring others to know you. Lord, may we believe you can use both our imperfections and our gifts for good. Lord, thank you for the ongoing doorstep blessings that we've been enjoying. Thank you for the encouragement being shared by unexpected messages, phone calls and gifts. Lord, give us courage where we may feel anxious, strength where we may be weary, hope where we feel frustration and companions for the journey where we may feel lonely. 
Lord, as we approach nearly a year on since lockdown, thank you for sustaining us this far. However, we also pray for those who are struggling. Lord, comfort those who have lost loved ones. And Lord, we ask that you would intercede in the lives of those suffering at home or in hospital with COVID at this time. We pray for your protection over them, for your healing hand to be on them, and for your spirit to bring restoration in them. Thank you for our NHS and all the amazing people working tirelessly on the front line to save lives and to care for people in need. Lord, thank you for the millions who are now receiving vaccinations. We pray that the rollout continues smoothly. We pray that communities will be confident in the protection it offers and will take it up when offered. We pray especially for our city of Peterborough that you would reduce the high levels of infection and that in the months ahead, we will see cases subside and the opportunities for social connection and community will once again be restored. We pray for families that have had so much to contend with, everyone trying to work within limited home space, the struggles of homeschooling, limited contact with friends and so few options of other things to do and places to go. And now, as schools prepare to open up fully again, we pray for your peace to settle the emotions. For some, it is great news. For others, there is real fear about returning to routines which may feel far from normal and still with so much uncertainty. May you give our children and young people confidence and reassurance. Please, Lord, would you keep them safe and well and please help them to be able to catch up with work they have missed and enable them to achieve the potential that you created them for. We lift up all teachers and teaching support workers to you. We pray for them as they're involved in getting schools back on track. Please support them, Lord, as they prepare not just for teaching, but for safety measures that need to be adhered to and the practicalities of testing that's required in secondary schools. Please give them all patience, encouragement and discernment as they're such a focal point in the country's journey towards a smooth recovery. Lord, we pray for our communities and our country. Lord, give us measured restraint as we begin to reverse some lockdown measures, that as we rejoice in those glimmers of light, we would not act in a way which threatens the progress that has been made over the past months. Father, we lift up our leadership team to you as they also begin to now plan ahead and work through what we may do as, as and when church can begin again in earnest. Father, thank you for all that they have done and continue to do out of sight to support Breton Baptist Church. Father God, we do not know what the months ahead will bring, but we know and trust that you hold the future in your hands. We simply ask to know your presence on the journey. Let us turn to you more, read and learn from your word. Let us be open to where you can use us and help us to support each other through our actions and prayers. Father, we ask all of these things in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to our online service at Breton Baptist Church. Before we uh, get into the Word and before we have the reading, we have some exciting news. This morning, we are welcoming three more sisters into membership at Breton Baptist Church. So you'll see them on the screen as I share their names. Uh, through the newsletter, they have submitted uh, there a little uh, a note about them so you can get to know them more. Some of them you probably already know, but um, maybe you can all send a blessing to these sisters to welcome them into membership um, from here on. They would have received uh, a membership card this morning from us uh, in the post and hopefully they're opening it right now as people have written in uh, scripture that God has given to them for these new members. So we welcome into membership Moira Turtle, Maureen Tuttle and Leona Kajawa. 
we are delighted that you have chosen to join us in God's great mission to Peterborough and Breton. We look forward to working together in serving God in mission, in worship, and allowing him to release the powers of heaven together in all of us. Let me just pray over you and thank God for you. Living, loving God of light, God of might and God of power, sustainer of life, the one who watches over each and every one of us, we thank you for your abundance. We thank you for our three sisters, Maureen, Leona and Moira, coming into membership this day. Lord, may we welcome them with open arms, an outstretched arm and a warm heart. Father, may you bless them. May you encourage them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. May we as a church, even under these restricted times, send words of encouragement and love as we continue to encourage more to join us in faith, worship and service. Lord, reveal to them more of the spiritual blessings that you have poured upon them, the spiritual gifts that you have poured into their lives and released them to see your will at work through them. Bless them and keep them, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you, Moira, Maureen and Leona. We look forward to joining together with you as these weeks, months and years unfold uh, for the glory of God. Now, before I share what God's placed on my heart for us this morning, we're going to have our reading taken from John's Gospel, chapter 5. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here is a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralysed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. Sabbath. The Lord forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. But Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made them well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making him equal with God. Have you picked the theme up here? The theme of water running through the first seven chapters of John's Gospel, right from chapter one through to chapter seven. So in chapter five, we have another encounter with water in the middle of the whole scene of looking through a window, a glimpse through the window of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know water plays a significant part to what it means to be set right with God. It's a, it's a symbol of purification. 
in chapter 4 we looked at the living water. We're going to be looking at rivers of living water by chapter 7. Um, Jesus and John being baptised, um, the, the encounter with Nicodemus in chapter 3, the, the water into wine in the wedding at Cana uh, in chapter 1. Constantly John is using this a metaphor of water to get the message over. But this one is quite significantly interesting because I don't know if you noticed in that reading, verse 4 was missed out. Now, in the most Bibles, NIV, uh, the NRFVA, the, the um, Good News, they, they miss out quite a few verses, approximately 30 verses compared to something like the King James Version or the New King James Version, which would have included uh, verse 4, which talks about um, this, this uh, Paul of Siloam uh, was a, a place where people believed they got healed when the water got stirred up, the angel would come down and would heal somebody or the first person to get to the pool. And this man had been there for 38 years and never managed to get to the front of the queue or the, or the entourage of people trying to wrestle for that um, opportunity to get him, get him um, healed. They believed that the water possessed some kind of uh, healing properties. Now, the reason why we don't have it in the Bibles that m many of us read is because um, it's not believed to be original source. So it would say... Um, in some Bibles, other manuscripts would have uh, things about the pool. Verse 4 would explain about the pool. But for original sources, they don't believe um, it is necessary to include because it can't be authenticated. So a very interesting scenario that, that this water, Jesus doesn't use the water. Jesus doesn't include the water. Jesus just comes along and, and, it, and it does, the man doesn't even acknowledge Jesus. We know in this account that he didn't even know who healed him. Um, when he was asked by the Jewish leaders, who, who told you to pick up your mat? Who healed you? They were more interested in the fact that he picked up his mat on the Sabbath. Um, it, right at the end of that passage, it does say that um, you know, you're not supposed to even heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus does exactly that. In fact, the Pharisees say at the end of the passage that Jesus claims to be equal with God. But well, actually, Jesus doesn't claim to be equal with God. If you read that passage, it says that Jesus says um, in verse 17, my father is still working and I also am working. And for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, two rules on the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. Well, we know in Philippians chapter uh, 2, verse 6, he, uh, Paul says that God, Jesus doesn't do that. So, a right interesting mishmash of conversation and conflict going on in this short passage. But isn't it interesting that a man encounters Jesus, receives a blessing, doesn't look for it, doesn't ask for it, but gets it, and then goes off, Jesus slips away, so as not to be known because his time hadn't come to be glorified, and the man gets quizzed. Jesus meets him again in the temple where we can only assume that the man continues to live a life of begging. And Jesus questions him. What are you still doing living a life like this when you've been healed? You know, something worse may happen to you. Stop sinning. What an interesting conversation. What an interesting dialogue. I'll tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of a film I once watched, um, well, several times actually, and some people may find this film a little bit offensive. It's called The Life of Brian. It's a Monty Python film. And I want to um, act out, if I can, um, in my poor way of acting, this uh, part of this scene. It's a scene where um, Brian... Um, and his mum, who's acted by a man, has just come away from a stoning. And on their way home, through the streets of Jerusalem, uh, they're approached by an ex-leper. 
And it goes something like this. Half a shekel for an old leper. Old ex-leper. Did you say ex-leper, says Brian? The ex-leper says, that's right, sir. 16 years behind the vow and proud of it. What happened, says Brian? I was cured, sir. Cured. Cured, says Brian? Yes, sir. Bloody miracle. God bless him. Who cured you, says Brian? Jesus did, sir. I was hopping along, minding my own business. All of a sudden, up comes this man and he cures me. One minute, I'm a leper with a trade. Next minute, my livelihood is gone. Not so much as a buy or leave. You're cured, mate. Thanks. Well, says Brian, why don't you go and ask him to put you back as a leper? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, well, I could do that, sir, says the ex-leper. Yes, um, I suppose I could do, sir. Well, what I was thinking, really, sir, was asking him if he could make me a leper, sort of a bit of a leper, during the week, maybe, maybe a lame leg in one of my legs, in, in the middle of the week, um, you know, something beggable, but not totally leprosy, which is a pain in the rear end, to be blunt, sir. So Brian gives the man some money, puts it in his pot. The leper says, thank you, sir. The ex-leper says, thank you, sir. And looks at the uh, bowl and says, uh, half a denarii for my life history. Brian says, there's no pleasing someone, uh, uh, some people these days. And the ex-leper says, just, just what Jesus said, sir. It reminds me of that story where the ex-leper was using his disability, his unfortunate circumstances to make a life. And this comparison is similar in this story. The man, for 38 years, he made an excuse that he could not get to the front of the pool because of all the rush of the people. For 38 years, he'd sort of become dependent on his own disability. So whatever his disability was, we're not clear through the scriptures what that may be. It just says he was unwell, he was ill, he was an invalid, depending on what version you read. So we notice something wrong, but he continues to use it. He uses an excuse to say that he can't. And all Jesus says is get up, pick up your mat and go. Pick up your mat and go. There's a sort of natural, supernatural approach to this, isn't there? It got me thinking about our happiness. What makes you happy? Seriously, what makes you, why does that make you happy? There's a film called Cool Runnings. I like using contemporary films for, for getting the gospel message out. I, I, you're probably picking that up. It's about the first Jamaican bobsled team to go to the national, um, the, the, the global Olympics. John Candy plays this American coach who was a gold medalist who became um, the Jamaican team's coach. The players grew to like this American coach and affectionately dubbed him Sled God. Later in the story, the coach's dark history rises up and in an Olympics following his gold medal performance, he broke the rules by weighing the US sled, bringing disgrace on himself and the whole of his team. One of the Jamaican uh, bobsledders could not understand why anyone who had already won a gold medal would cheat. Finally, he could not hold back. He nervously asked the coach to explain what had happened. And the coach said, I had to win. I learned something. If you are not happy without a gold medal, you won't be happy with it. What makes you happy and why? Uh, the great philosopher uh, Aristotle, 2,300 years ago, proclaimed that happiness is not only possible, but not, not is the only possible purpose and aim in life because it is the only goal that is an end in itself. It is said that we are only ever truly happy when we're babies. 
As long as our basic survival needs are met, simply living in the moment is enough. Exploring and experiencing our new world. Where does it all go wrong? How does it all get so complicated? How is it that this man seemed to be happy, disabled, or an invalid, or unwell? He seemed to be quite comfortable, quite content. My guess is, his unbelief trapped him in a spiritual spiral. He had entered through a spiritual door that caused him to have lack of belief in himself and the God who presented himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, that Jesus does not hold back the blessing despite his unbelief. But his unbelief was not disregarded. God blessed him, but he did not believe in the giver. He just received the gift and ran off with it. Did nothing with it. He just returned to his old ways. Isn't that great that Jesus does not have any um, favourites? I recently read a chapter from a book called Wake Up by a guy called Chris Partridge. He talks about what are your emotions really telling you? He says that our happiness becomes buried beneath layers of restrictive fear-based thoughts. Beliefs and attitudes, it claims it changes the potential for happiness within a thriving to struggle of merely surviving. And he's got an acronym of, which spells out happiness and he's got two ways of looking at that ha- acronym. The first is this, hoping all painful problems identified never evoke superficial sadness. And the second is this, having all personal potentials in nearly every stressful situation. How are you looking at life? Where does your happiness come from? Where do, what spiritual doors are you opening in your life? Because we can open spiritual doors and get a happiness that is unhealthy. Or we can open spiritual doors that gives us a happiness that is fruitful, that is healthy, that is life-giving. So much of this world is life-draining, life-sucking. What spiritual doors are we willing to unlock? This story of the man by the pool, he chose to continue opening unhealthy spiritual doors. But God did not take the blessing away from him. He went away healed. Do you currently see life problems and challenges as pains that need to be avoided or solved? My guess is this man was avoiding trying to deal with the real issue. He'd become defeated. He'd lost all hope and belief that there is a God and belief in himself. Or do you see them as opportunities to stop and see something from a different perspective? Maybe because they appear to be asking you to stop and see yourself from a different perspective. How do you think God sees you? See, when When I read this story, when I reflect on this account, I see Jesus walking up and seeing a whole array of um, invalid people, unwell people, uh, within these five porticles um, who, who, who have lost hope and lost belief and only see their limitations, only see their disabilities, rather than seeing themselves the way God sees them. God doesn't look at our limitations. He looks at our potential and our opportunities. He looks at what we are and not what we think we are. He looks at us as ambassadors to his word, conquerors in this world. 
It was about 2006 when I read the article in the national newspaper that we are a healthier and wealthier nation, but not a happier nation. The world does not have the answers for our happiness unless we open the spiritual doors, unlock the spiritual doors within us, that is Christ within us. Unless we unlock those, we are not going to gain that true sense of heavenly joy. John is offering a glimpse into the life of Jesus, how he naturally moves in the supernatural. Jesus is fully human. Jesus engages in conversation with this man who has been unwell for over 38 years. The man did not approach Jesus. He didn't even get that it was Jesus. How many times has Jesus approached you or me and we have not known it was Jesus? The man went on sinning regardless of his being made well. How often do you encounter God's forgiveness, God's healing, God's anointing, and so easy slip away or forget what he has done for you. The lack of attention from the ill man and the religious leaders to how naturally Jesus moved in the supernatural, because they were, they were more concerned about the rules being broken on the day, and this is not a man that should have this authority. They were embarrassed, they were afraid, they were ashamed because they didn't move in naturally in the supernatural. Are we trying to be super spiritual without allowing it to flow from being naturally supernatural? The ill man was not willing to let go of what he had become dependent on. What are we depending on? What are we holding on to? What are we refusing to let go of in order to encounter, to taste, to touch, to be moved by the supernatural things of God? We have the potential of unlocking spiritual doors, healthy spiritual doors. It's interesting, Jesus asked the man, doesn't he, in verse 6, do you want to be made well? What a question. Have you ever asked people that? Do you want to be made well? Maybe they would get offended. Maybe you feel it's, a, it's, a, a, it's an unhelpful question. I think it's a very helpful question. Do you really want to be made well? Do you really want this living water? Because it could be costly. That living water could be costly. I was speaking to somebody in prison yesterday, literally only yesterday, and I said to them, the problem with some men, they're not man enough to accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Now, 25 years ago, I would have said to be a Christian, you had to be a wimp. Now I look at it the other way round. To be a Christian, you need to be a man or a woman. A serious, a man and woman who is serious about living life in abundance. Do you want to be made well? What's stopping you from getting up and moving on? What's stopping you from picking yourself up and moving on? Jesus has made you well. Are you still sitting by the pool? Are you having trouble recognising Jesus? I believe Jesus, as I say, regularly is right where you are he meets us right where we are he met this man right where he was he went to the man the man did not go to him Jesus comes to us he knocks at our door waiting to let him in for us to let him in don't miss the fact that Jesus is right where you are sometimes we just have to learn to let things go. When we witness the love of God at work, we have a choice to let it grab us or to let it pass us. And I think this man let it pass him. 
because he was still an invalid in his mind and maybe his heart. He was grabbed by a greater disability than any physical um, a disability. He was grabbed by the disability of his mind. I believe there are more people who are disabled in their mind and potentially in their heart. They often look at disabled people and see their disability. When you see a disabled person, what do you see? Do you see their disability or do you see their potential? Do you see their limitations or do you see their opportunities? That's a challenge. I was um, privileged to walk a disabled lady through the waters of baptism some years ago. Um, from a non-believer to a believer, she was um, uh, confined to a wheelchair, still is confined to a wheelchair this day. And um, God made it possible for her to walk through the waters of baptism. And I had the privilege of baptising her and seeing her grow in her faith. She dared to unlock a spiritual door and God had been doing things in her life ever since. She was challenged. This man by the pool refused to be challenged. So his life just rolled on as it was from 38 years back. We don't know really what happens to this man. We don't know if he did have a change of heart and mind or whether he became a follower of Jesus. We have no idea. John's gospel does not open up that opportunity, that privilege to know. John maybe didn't even know himself. But when we meet Jesus, we are challenged. Are you challenged by your faith? Does it change you? Jesus challenged this man's faith. The man's biggest disability was the one in his head. Convince your head you are disabled, unable, and your heart will sink. Your soul will drown in the, in the unbelief. The unbelief of yourself. The unbelief that the love of Jesus causes you to stand, to rise. Causes you to rise and meet Jesus who is right with you, right where you are. Right now, right by the pool in your house. I hope you don't have a pool coming from the upstairs and flooding your house, but I, you, you, the living water is the Holy Spirit and that pool of the Holy Spirit is right where you are. It allows us to move naturally in the supernatural. That living water is the living spirit and it unlocks spiritual doors for us as we go forward. Constantly, we are being presented with opportunities of meeting Jesus for the first time again. Whether we are finding ourselves in, in um, restricted times of physical lockdown, we are still free to go out. We are still free to do many things, as has been explained and witnessed in the doorstep blessings. I believe Jesus has come to each of our spaces right here, right now. The questions we need to ask ourselves is, do I recognise him? I believe that Jesus is speaking to you right here, right now. The question you need to ask yourself is, do I want to hear him? I believe Jesus wants to touch your life, to move your life and to give you a taste of heaven. The question you have to ask yourself is, do I want it? Do I want it in my life? Do I want to be touched by heaven's power? You have two choices like I do. Every morning we wake up, receive it or reject it. Grab it or miss it. We are left with that challenge of what are we holding on to? What are we allowing to feed our soul? What spiritual doors are you unlocking in your life? Because the living water is a sign of purification. Not purification that you will become right in everything. Purification in that you would desire to love the way Jesus loves. And when you love the way Jesus loves, you form relationships, healthy relationships. And it enables you to be a channel of that life-giving water that floods through every fibre of your body, in every word that you speak, in every thought that you have, in every act that you perform. It becomes naturally supernatural. 
And you don't have to think about, right, I'm going to get in that zone of prayer and I'm going to get all spiritual right now and I want the Holy Spirit to come and move. No, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, what are you waiting for? Get up and move. Just get up and go forward. Don't be afraid. Don't hold back. Have courage. Step forward. Get up and go. Pick up the phone. Send something to someone. Pass on the abundance that you have. I'm not talking about your wealth. I'm talking about what God has put inside you. God is calling you to build, be, be a part of building his church. Today I was just chatting with another member of the leadership team about the vision of this church. We're excited about what God is doing. We're excited about what God is doing. And I just want to be a part of it. I just want to get up and move forward and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Let's not make it complicated. Your joy comes from the Lord. Nehemiah reminds us of this in chapter 8, verse 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What water are you drinking? Are you drinking the living water? Or are you drinking the water that keeps you thirsty again and again and again. Jesus has come to you and he wants to have a conversation with you and he wants to transform your life. He wants to move you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us just stop for a moment and sit by the pool. Stand by the pool. Lay by the pool. The pool in itself has no power from heaven. The pull is just a pull where people are are holding on to something that is not of God. If you're holding on to things that are not of God, just imagine yourself literally holding that right now. Name it. Name it out loud or name it in your head. But most importantly, name it in your heart and hold it in your hand and say, Jesus, I let go of this. I do not need this, Jesus. I place it at your feet. I place it at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, take it from me. Take it from me. I let it go. I'm going to grab hold of you, Jesus. I'm going to grab your feet, and I'm going to listen to your words. And Jesus says, let it go. Open your heart to the living water. Open your soul to the power of heaven. Receive from him now. Jesus, I receive from you all that you wish to give me. My wealth, my health and my happiness is in you. I let it all go for the glory of your kingdom. To live is for Christ. To die is gain, says Paul. Lord, today the people of Breton Baptist Church, the new members, Leona, Maureen, Moira, and all the brothers and sisters of Breton Baptist Church, we recommit ourselves to you now. Let us recommit ourselves to Jesus as individuals, but as one part of the body of Jesus Christ called Breton Baptist Church. We recommit ourselves to you and say, Lord, we want to be made well for your glory. Purify us. We will stand up and we will continue following you and proclaiming your love, living your love in every aspect of our lives. We want to pass on the abundance of your blessings in our lives. This we pray in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.
King Jesus, you're the song we sing. You are, you are, you are, you are over everything. You are the eternal King Jesus, you're the song we sing. You are, you are, you are. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Do join us after the service for our Zoom chill and chat. The details will be in the chat section of your screen. Don't forget the prayer, praise and prophecy meeting this evening and also to join us in our monthly prayer and fasting day on Tuesday. Let us close in prayer together. Lord, thank you that we are united as a family in Christ. Help us to share his love and hope with everyone we encounter this week. May we listen carefully to hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit, nudging us to take a step of faith, to speak to that neighbour, to phone that friend, to leave a doorstep blessing, to be that little bit bolder in our walk with you. Thank you for choosing to use us to bring your kingdom here on earth. Amen.